So this week, um, we are going over functions. <clears throat> and on the right of your screen, you should see some learning objectives. And um, I'm going to be going through the information on the left. So um, <clears throat> for this chapter, um, the learning objectives are basically to write functions um, or figure out how to write functions um, in a way that other people can read and the computer can read. Um, and functions automate common tasks. Um, and the definition of a function from Merriam-Webster Webster is the special purpose or activity for which a thing exists or is used. And in math, a function relates an input to an output. So um, I just wanted to put those out there because when I first heard of functions in math, I did not know what they were. Um, so the reasons for writing a function, um, you can automate repetitive tasks. You can give the function <clears throat> a name that makes the purpose very clear. And you only need to update the code in one place as things change. Um, and it's safer, when, uh, safer than copying and pasting um, because you won't replicate errors. Um, and I found it very reassuring that the author said that writing functions is a lifetime journey um, because I'm still very early in my journey and it seems a little daunting. Um, so this chapter basically gives um, pragmatic advice and suggestions for styling your functions. Um, and the most important thing is to be consistent across your code. And um, so when to write a function, like when would you do that? Um, consider writing a function when you've copied and pasted code more than two times. And I also saw that reference in another text that I was reading. Um, so it seems like it makes good sense and seems to be common practice. Um, the author suggests that it's easier to have working code and then turn it into a function rather than the other way around. Um, and there are some key steps in creating a function. You want to pick a name that makes it clear what the function does. Um, the arguments or inputs go inside function, like so. So you have function with uh, beginning parentheses, the word arguments, and then the end parentheses. <clears throat> and the code goes inside curly braces, um, or apparently they're also called wavy brackets. <laughs> um, and they go after the function, the word function, and the arguments in the parentheses. And then it's also a good idea to check your function with a few inputs to make sure that it is working. Um, and there's apparently an advanced way to do this that is beyond the scope of the book that we are currently reading. Um, and since everything is contained in the function, it is easier to fix. And so I will just go over the example that they have in the book. Um, <clears throat> in this first, sorry, my mouse wheel is not happy. Okay. <laughs> In the first block of code, um, this is code that creates a data frame. And then um, <clears throat> the code below that extracts the range of each column and rescales it um, to have a range from zero to one. And then um, you can see that if you are copying and pasting, it'd be easy to just take this first line, copy and paste, and put it in the second line and the third line and the fourth line, and then just change all the variables, but, uh, or change all of, are they variables? <laughs> are they vectors? Either, uh, I think vectors Either are or. technically more correct. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you would uh, change the vector names, but you can see here, um, oh no, we forgot the A. It's supposed to be a B. Um, so the equation slash code has one input in the form of data frame dollar sign A. And so 
we can make the inputs more clear using a temporary variable, say X. And you can see below that that definitely does make the code more readable. And let me just make sure. <laughs> So you can see that we do have some outputs from that. Um, and then we can simplify that even more by consolidating all the ranges. So this uh, equation up here, the x minus min, blah, 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 um, is just getting the range um, of all of those columns. Thank and you, sorry, what is na.rm? I so that, that's okay. Um, so that is um, the dot RM is remove. remove and okay. so we want to remove all of the NAs. Um, okay. So yeah, sense. when it says NA dot RM equals true, that removes all of the NA values. If it was okay. false, it would keep them in so that you could see that you had uh, NAs in your data. Okay. Um, and if you, if you think about like NA means you know, unknown basically. And so if you're trying to figure out what is the minimum of a set of data and there's mm -hmm. an NA in it, by default, what R is doing is saying, well, I don't know what the, the minimum is because this missing value could be the minimum. And then you'll also right. say, oh, I don't know what the maximum is because the missing value could be the maximum. Right. And so without the NA.RM equals true, if there are any NAs, both your minimum and your maximum are NA. Okay. Oh. I, I guess thought... I was just wondering why that's there because the way that the original vectors were created is an R norm. Does that generate any uh, values? It doesn't. I he's think so. No, he's just putting it in there for safety for the function. Okay. Okay. So that if your function, if when you call the function, anything has an NA in it, logically you don't want it to matter. Okay. Okay. That, that makes sense. sense. Yep. And I always look at NA and see that as not available. So it's, that's maybe a good way to remember it. Like, yeah, it, that, it's, um, I think that is technically what it stands for. But uh, I, okay. I, I think of it, you know, I think of it as like, I don't know. Um, I don't know what this is, whether it's because I couldn't collect it or, um, you know, some other reason that the data is missing, but it's, you know, keep if you keep in mind that it's something that you don't know, I think it's it's helpful for things like, well, what's the minimum? Well, one of my values is unknown, and that value could be the lowest value, so I don't know what my minimum is. Um, and so that's why, like by default, a lot of things in R include the include NAs and then just return NA, and it can be kind of annoying if you're not ready for it, but it's like to caution you, like, hey, you don't actually know what the minimum is of this data set if it has NAs in it. Anyway, that's a an aside. Um, my other it. aside on this is I didn't know about range. Like it's just, it's minimum and maximum wrapped together into one function. I don't think I had ever used that function um, before. So I thought that was interesting. Um, oh shoot, I was gonna say something and completely oh, forgot. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> Um, all right, so um, we have consolidated the code and yay, it still works. Um, and finally, we can put the code inside the function, which is the point of this entire chapter. Um, and the function has been named rescale01 to be clear about what it does, rescales each column to have a range of zero to one. And um, it does still work. Um, we, te uh, we tested it out with a different set of inputs than um, what was uh, what we looked at above, and you can see that it still works. So we went from the super complicated thing to a very nice sleek function. So when you are writing functions. Um, they have to make sense for both computers and humans. Um, both yourself and maybe someone else might be looking at your code. So they have to make sense to everyone involved. 
Um, and that means that naming is really hard. Um, and that was also good to hear because I always have problems naming the functions. <laughs> um, the name should be so short yet descriptive. Um, but yeah, sometimes I have to get up and walk around and think. <laughs> um, functions should be verbs in action, state, or occurrence. And arguments should be nouns, people, places, or things. Um, there are exceptions, like if the noun is well known, like mean is a function. Um, and it's better than compute mean. Um, or if you have a verb that is broad, like get or compute. Um, if you have multiple words, consider snake case or camel case. Um, again, just be consistent. Um, it makes your code easier to read. If you have a collection of functions that do similar things, um, use consistent naming and arguments. Again, consistency. Um, consider using a common prefix. Um, if you have uh, like a set of functions that do kind of the same thing, um, that'll be really helpful if you're trying to choose it from the autocomplete list. Um, and try to override existing functions and variables. Um, and then as far as comments, um, use that to explain the why of your code, not the how or the what. Um, in theory, you should already know what your code does, um, or you should be able to read the program and figure out what it does. Um, and the author suggests that comments can also help break up the code. You can use a dash or equals um, in succession to kind of create um, a visual break line in your code. And then um, he also mentioned control shift R automatically makes these headers, but I couldn't get that to work. I think you have to be in a .r file instead ah, of okay. .rmd for that okay. to mean anything, basically. Um, yeah. Okay. So um, then we have conditional execution, and this is if statements. They conditionally execute code, and the condition must evaluate to true or false. Um, and so this is where it gets a little tricky for me. Um, a function returns the last value it computed. Um, it will only return one value. Again, that goes back to kind of the mathematical definition of a function. It relates one input to one output. Um, but be careful um, because the double equal sign is vectorized, which means that operations occur in parallel in certain R objects, and it's easy to get more than one output. Um, and we are going to be talking about vectors in the next chapter. Um, so this y um, that is the six colon nine that creates a vector, and then the y double equals eight is checking does y equal or is y equal to the value of eight, but you can see that there's four values. So this doesn't necessarily uh, return just one output for one input. So um, you should either check the length that the length is already one, and you can do that with uh, the function length, um, or you can collapse it. And I uh, I'm not sure what that was. I tried to get help on the collapse function and I was doing some Googling and I just could not figure that out. If anyone knows what that is. Um, I, I think he's important? just saying um, <laughs> there are various ways to collapse it, like, a, um, like the any and all functions which take a string of or a, you know, a vector of trues and falses, and like the any function, if anything in the vector is true, then it returns true. The all function, if everything in the vector ah. is true, it return, returns true. 
So that's one way to collapse it. Okay, so that is, if you can see, I highlighted it yeah. uh, further down. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, can I ask a, a clarification question? So I think I'm not understanding what the double equal signs is vectorized means. So it, it is, oh gosh. <laughs> Sorry. Let me see, yeah, no, let me see if I, can, I, I know what it is, but I'm not sure I can explain it. So the easy, or the, the I don't know, not necessarily easy, but the, the way to think about it is, a vectorized function, if you give it a vector of inputs, like six, seven, eight, nine, which is what mm -hmm. you're giving it, then it returns a vector of outputs, okay. that one output for each of the inputs. So you're saying six, seven, eight, nine equals equals eight. It's returning six equals 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 eight, seven equals equals eight, eight equals equals eight, nine equals equals eight. So it, it does like, you know, each of those four values that it returns, it's one value for each of the inputs. Oh, okay. That's what vectorized so, means, which is, it's a really powerful thing that R does. Like it makes mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, you can do computations on an entire column of data and mm -hmm. just by running, you know, uh, equals equals or whatever. But in this case, when you're just trying to say, should I run this thing? You want one, you know, you need to have one value of true or false to determine whether you should run this thing for for like an if. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, so, I think so. I'll, I'll okay, thank you. For the context of a function, we want one input and one output. <clears throat> I mean, so, for, for if, you, you can, yeah. so when it says a function has one output, like that one output can be a vector, which is, mm. can be kind of confusing. <laughs> Um, but for for if specifically you want it to have just the one thing, because otherwise it only takes the first value in the vector. And like in this case, if you were trying to say, um, I want this to run if uh, any of the values are eight, it wouldn't run because it would get that false from six. And that's where you would need the any, which we're going to get to in a second. Is that, mm. that make Wait. sense? We are going to be talking yeah. about vectors in the next chapter, hopefully, that yes. we will kind of go through this a little bit in more detail. <laughs> um, so, let's see. Returns true if the two <laughs> objects are exactly equal. It doesn't coerce types. And I just, I wasn't sure what coercing types meant. All right. So I have this one ready to go. Okay. So I, I saw that question. So um double and integer are for example two different types of numbers mm -hmm. a double would be like where you have a decimal place um integer you don't basically yeah. to specify an r that you mean the integer version you put an l after it um which i used to know why that is and i can't remember anymore but mm -hmm. it's I, I don't know whatever so if you see something like one l that means the integer one so Ah, okay. So given that if you run identical 1.0 and one point or and one L, R says no, those aren't identical because it doesn't coerce types. Versus 1.0 equals equals one L. And let me pay, copy paste that. Equals equals does coerce types. So it says okay, double 1.0, integer one L, those are the same thing. Because it did that's what coerce types means. It's, it turns the 1.0 into an integer and says, okay, they're the same thing. Wow. Did that That's make sense? Seems like you could get mm -hmm. into trouble with that. Um, you can. Sometimes. Right. And, and so that's why okay. identical really means identical. Like these are the same thing. And so if you wanted to do what I did that first time, you could do like um, this. Something like that, where you explicitly say, okay, coerce that first one into an integer and then check whether they're the same thing. Yeah, same wow. thing. Wow. Okay. Like or I guess so the safer direction would be um, this as double. Because, you know, hmm. as double of 1L, it's going to be 1.0, you know, 1. 
infinite zeros. As integer of 1.0, oh, 1.1, for example, can get ugly. So anyway, wow. I hope, hope that helped at least a little bit. <laughs> so it, it really is, it really does mean coerce. Yes. It's, okay. Yep. Um, Turns it into so, the other thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this means you need to be careful with integers and doubles. Okay. Um, so you can use, um, is that the pipe? The, yes. Um, yeah, the double pipe, but not like the R <laughs> percent <laughs> sign pipe, um, which means or, and the double ampersand, which means and, to combine multiple logical expressions. Um, so for example, y and x. Um, but just be careful, a single pipe and a single ampersand are vectorized operations, again, that apply to multiple values. Um, if you do have a logical vector, which we might talk about in the next chapter, um, like John was saying earlier, use any and or any or all functions to collapse it into a single value. Um, and be wary of floating point numbers, again, <laughs> um, when using the double equal sign. Um, instead, use the d plier, um, the function near from the d plier package as mentioned in chapter five, data transformation and comparisons. Um, so we can also have a different version of the if statement, which is multiple conditions. Um, you can string them together by saying if, if else, and else. Um, so if you end up with a long series of chained if statements, use switch. Um, and I realized that I had written an if statement. Um, so if this, do this thing, else if, that, do something else, else, um, do something else. Um, so the switch function, um, this it's the expression is matched to a list of cases. And if a match is found, then it prints that case's value. Um, and that help says switch and then the expression is the first argument. So I wasn't sure what was happening in the above example. Oh, wait, never mind. <laughs> I just saw the OP. So basically switch goes through each one of those, like the plus minus times divide. Um, and evaluates them. So that yeah, it's looking for, so the, the OP op is a word. So it'll be the word plus or the word minus, the word times, the word divide, or something else. And if it sees the word plus, it will add. If it sees the word minus, it will subtract. If it sees times, it multiplies. If it sees divide, it divides. And if it sees anything else, it says, I don't know what to do. So it, it does that stop. Okay. Thing. And so that OP is something that the user would put. Right. In, right, okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, cut can also be used um, to discretize continuous variables. Um, so cut can divide a range of like, say if you have X into intervals and codes the values in X according to which interv interval they fall in. So we'll just have different levels of X. Um, so code style, um, again, trying to be consistent and making your code readable. Um, use squiggly brackets or curly braces. Um, so your function or, wow, I'm not sure what I wrote there. Um, I want to pause a sec for oh. Lucy's question because oh, I'm it's sorry. very I didn't important. See it. She just asked it. Um, 
so there is in R this if else function. Are we going to talk about? I know it. It was mentioned in exercises, but I can't think. I don't think it was mentioned in the chapter itself. Um, it was not mentioned in the chapter, um, and I did not go through any of the exercises, so I'm not sure about that. Okay. Those. Um, if else is so the difference is. Oops, let me do this. There is this function that I'm going to type. I guess Lucy said it versus. Um, that so there's if else one word one is a function and then you can have things like um becky has where it's if else if else on multiple lines if else is a vectorized function that takes some input that you're trying to test and um so like let me do a simple version of it if you had if else um true false true oops true um, uh, we could have something like this. Let me run this and make sure it does what I think it does. So, um, yeah. So if what that's going to do is it looks at each of those values and sees, are they true or false? If they're true, it says yes. If they're false, it says no. Um, a, a more common thing would be like if else, um, let's see, oops, would be <laughs> this to kind of go back to what we were looking at before. Um, you could check each of the things to see are they equal to eight? And it, you know, all right, let me make a cleaner version of that. So instead of saying it's eight and it isn't, say either NA or, or say either eight or NA, let's say. And so if I want to get rid of any value that isn't eight for some reason, that would be a, a case where you use if else. Um, versus the if else, like where it's separate functions, you can do, you're doing one test at a time and then doing whatever inside of that particular test. So each one is separate. Um, people confuse this a lot. Like we've had lots of uh, R4DS questions that are, hey, why isn't this code working? And it's because they used if else instead of if else. And they, they do related but different things. Um, and it can be confusing. The reason he doesn't go over if else is um, when you're doing something conditional, that's probably not what you mean. You probably don't mean the if else function. You probably mean if else. Um, if you're doing, like if you're inside of a mutate, that would be a case where if else would make sense, where you're saying, I want to create this new variable that is, you know, in one case it's this, in another case it's that. Um, and yeah, okay, so in, um, in the exploratory data analysis, uh, what was it, section 7.4, uh, Ryan pulled up that there is some talk about if else. And then there's also if, in dplyr, there's if underscore else, which is basically just a, um, it's a version of if else that has better uh, error messages and, and better, better handling of mistakes. Um, so, you know, you you have three sets of functions. You have the separate if else, you have if else, and you have if underscore else. The last two are basically the same. The first two, the, the if and else as separate functions um, are what you want when you're writing a function, basically. I, I know that was still pretty big, but I hope it helped at least a little. <laughs> okay. John, so that for the one that is if underscore else, is that just from a different package, but does the same as the if else function? Yeah, so okay. base, base R has if else, all, is, all one word. Mm -hmm. um, kind of notoriously, base R, a lot of the R, R error messages are confusing. It's not really clear what went wrong. And so mm -hmm. dplyr has if underscore else, you know, within the tidy verse, there's if underscore yeah. else, which is basically the same function, just written in a way that it can 
um, help you catch errors. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. <laughs> okay. Um, so code style, um, squiggly brackets or curly braces, whatever you call them, um, they go after your function and after the if statement. So we have an example below. So we have our function and then a space um, followed by a curly brace, then a new line, indent two spaces, um, put the code into your function, and then new line with no indenting and a curly brace. Um, and this just helps identify code hierarchy when you are scanning it. Um, and then it's a little different for the if else. So you have if and your condition space curly brace and then the condition indented to curly brace space else space curly brace. So we've got else kind of bracketed by um, outward facing braces. Um, you can use one line if your statement is very short. Um, this is the short version of the second code up above here. So um, if y is less than 20, um, then x will be too low. Otherwise, it will be too high. And that's basically what we just wrote out up there. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, put spaces around operators like equals, plus, and minus. Um, that also makes code much easier to read. And uh, now we move on to function arguments. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, I oh. just wanted to, I want to say, I like he had a comment. I can't remember exactly what it was, but it's something when he's talking about, you know, you can smoosh it onto one line. Basically, mm -hmm. you know, his point is don't, like, it doesn't hurt to take up more space. And if it's more readable, um, why not? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's, um, and that's a common theme within the tidyverse that kind of he tries to really drill in is code is as much for people as it is for computers. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to read it. You want um, both, you know, people you're working with and, um, you know, your most common collaborator who is future you, you want them to be able to read it and adding a, an extra, you know, set of lines like the if else, like it makes it really clear what happens on the if and what happens on the else versus when it's smooshed onto one line, it, you can get a little lost in it. Um, so I, I, I like that advice of it almost never hurts to be a little bit more spaced out and a little bit more um, explicit about how things are working. And, and plus, like if you go, oh, wait, I need to do, I need to add some formatting to the X or whatever, then it's easy to just add more lines into that little block. So I think that's good advice in general. And I really like that within this chapter, he spends a lot of time on the formatting advice, like make your code readable. Technically you can, you don't need, you know, you could just read the very beginning of this chapter and you'd know how to make functions, but your functions would be hard, hard to read. And therefore it's painful to, to work with them. So um, good advice. Um, yeah, um, he just says in the book, I recommend this only for very brief if statements, otherwise the full form is easier to read. Yeah, I think it was actually something else within this chapter oh, where okay. he had said, I, I can't remember exactly what, but he, he was like, you know, you know, like if you're, it might have been in the function names, it might, I don't know, there are various places where he's like, okay, yeah, maybe this is a little bit too long, but so what, or it could be in the argument, you know, there are lots of places, yeah. argument names too, like, oh, this argument name is a little too long, but you can tell what it means. Yeah. And our studio does autocomplete. So go on the, you know, error on the side of a little too long um, in general. I, not everyone agrees with that, but I agree with Headley on that argument. <clears throat> 
And also for beginning programmers, that makes it easier, like I am. <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, for function arguments, um, the arguments to a function typically fall into two broad sets. Um, one supplies the data to compute on, and the other supplies arguments that control the details of the computation. Um, generally, the data comes first and the details um, go on the end and usually have default values. And again, this is another place where na.rm is uh, very common. Um, <clears throat> so for example, log function, the first argument is x, which is the data, and the second argument is the base of the logarithm, which is the details. Um, and for mean, <clears throat> x is the data, and then the details are how much data to trim from the ends and how to handle missing values. Um, and he has some examples of the code. This is a good way to write it out. Um, and this is not a good way to write it out. Um, <clears throat> excuse me a sec. <clears throat> uh oh, I'm going to mute myself. <clears throat> Okay, <clears throat> I think I'm all right. <laughs> oh, the trim is, um, so say you want to take the mean of some data, but you have like huge outliers. Um, that just allows you to trim off um, something that might skew your data too far in either direction. One, is that right? And two, does that make sense? <laughs> It is right. Uh, okay. I, yeah, it's just like what what proportion of the data should you trim off of each end? Um, so, uh, and so I think normally um, when you're using mean, you just put in the data and just leave the um, the details to the defaults. Right. John, can you explain a little bit more of this uh, trim? Function? Yeah, so I'm trying to get a nice. Work? Got it. For example. because, I mean, to remove outliers, you probably have to run additional tests, like you know, standard deviations above or below the mean, and then how to justify that. Right. So it's a, it's a, a quick hack of that okay. basically. So here. Um, so if you have like really skewed data, like they're not, not even skewed, just you have some obvious outlier, outliers, mm -hmm. you can give it a trim to like, just just use the center for your, for uh, calculating the mean. And mm -hmm. so like, if I did that same thing, if I didn't make my weird data set, like if you do mean of one to 10, trim equals, what, I think the maximum is 0 0.5, oops. And you have to put an equal sign in there. <laughs> um, so if you if you have a, a uh, if you don't have outliers, basically, oh. it doesn't matter what you set trim to because you know if you've got like regular data, it's it's going to be the same whether you trim off the ends or not. Um, yeah, it, it makes a lot more sense when you've got like ten thousand observations and you're saying I want to trim off the the first. 1% and the last 1%, something like that. You're just saying, I don't, you know, those those really extreme ones, don't let them mess things up. I don't think, I don't think I've ever actually used trim because like you say, usually you want to be more explicit about what you're removing. Mm -hmm. But I could, I don't know, I've probably used it in just like quick analyses, you know, like uh, da exploratory data analysis right. okay. where you're trying to understand what you're looking at. Okay. Um, Rather than going through and figuring out, oh, can I eliminate these values? It's like, eh, let's just take a little bit off the top, a little bit off the bottom, and it'll work out. <laughs> okay. So then when you have uh, the argument to trim, that's a proportion or percentage? 
Yeah, it's a uh, it's okay. the fraction to be trimmed fraction from value. each end. Um, okay. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Um. All right. So uh, you specify a value in the same way you call a function with a named argument. For example, in the above means spelling out na dot rm equals true. Um, which skips NA values. Um, so choosing names for arguments are also important. Um, generally, they should be longer and descriptive, but there are some basic ones that are common. Um, X, Y, Z are vectors, W is a vector of weights, DF is a data frame, I and J is numeric indices for rows and columns. N is usually a length or a number of rows. Um, and then P is number of columns. Um, otherwise, use existing names, again, like the na.rm. Um, if you're curious why P means number of columns, that's for parameters. It's, yeah. If you think of the columns being the different parameters of your data, um, and that's like the statistical way of looking at it. So. Thank you. <clears throat> and so now we are getting into the area um, where I got a little lost, so I apologize. Um, so in this section, checking of checking values, you want to put checks into your function to make constraints explicit. Um, and you want to throw an error. And there's stop and stop if not, um, where you assert what should be true rather than checking for wrongs. Um, and in this section, um, this goes back to uh, Sandra's first question of like, why is this na.rm or you know, what is this na.rm equals false? Um, there are a lot of checks that you can put into your programs like that, but you can go overboard on that and you don't want to do that. And that's why um, the author says there's a trade-off between how much time you spend making your functions robust versus how long you spend writing it. Um, and so uh, the dot, dot, dot is an argument that takes an arbitrary number of values and you can use them in other functions. And I just, I did not understand this at all. <laughs> um, I, I am trying to find a, like a, a way to walk through this. So this is another thing that I don't, I don't know if I've ever seen this outside of R in other uh, programming okay. languages. And it's a, it's a neat idea. So what you can say is, you know, my function, um, takes uh, oh, like uh, think about um, mutate that when you mutate you are saying you know new new call equals whatever new call two equals whatever new call three technically all of those new calls are argument names and so the mutate function has dot 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 in its argument names it's saying it'll take anything it doesn't matter what you tell it it'll take that argument and it'll deal, deal with it um, but then you can also take the dot, dot, dots that are passed into one function and just pass that same dot, dot, dot onto another function. And that can be useful when, you know, let's say you're calling mean. Um, let me see if I can make a really, really quick uh, function. So um, my fun is a function that takes x dot, dot, dot. And this is stupid, but still, it'll um, show the idea. So um, mean has a whole bunch of arguments. And uh, when I wrote this imaginary function that here, um, well, and actually mean has dot, dot, dot arguments. But it, now I can say, um, oops, uh, my fun of 1 to 10. Um, trim equals 0 0.1. And that works even though I didn't name trim as one of the functions of my, or one of the arguments of my function, 
because it gets passed on to Mean and Mean knows what to do with the trim. Versus if I just said, if I didn't put the dots in there and I call that, so if I take, if I just say my fun is a function of X and I give it a trim argument, it, it doesn't know what to do with the trim argument. So it, it you know, it, it can't pass it on. So the dots are a way of saying, I don't know, whatever other arguments that the person passes in, deal with them in some way. So mutate, one way, you know, has one way of dealing with them where it explicitly like uses those weird extra um, arguments as column names. Um, mean has dot, dot, dot as arguments because you can write um, like versions of mean if you're trying to find the mean of, I don't know, words or something. Like maybe you write a version of mean that can take different cut types of argument. Who knows what arguments you would want to pass to it? So that's why it's got dot dot dot. Um, but it, it's like a catch-all. It's a etc. Um, set of arguments. Did that help at least a little? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's one of those that as you use it, it starts to make sense. But it's figured. <laughs> yeah. Um. I I would. What I would advise is like, just note that that is true and start working on things. And then when you get to a point where you're like, well, how do I pass all these arguments on to this other function? Have that little thing in your brain that goes, oh, right, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> so, so, uh, so is it kind of like, can you put a bunch of things in there? Yes. Yes. So dot 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 is all the other things. So let me, you know, in my oh, my so fun instead example, of like typing them out, you would just use the dot dot dot. Right, and, and the reason that can be useful is, um, uh, okay, I'm going to do another quick example. Okay. Uh, Uh, okay. This is, again, this is not something you would really write, but to kind of give you an example. Um, so I've got this second argument, fun name, mm -hmm. that uh, if it's mean, I want to pass all the rest of the stuff on to mean, and it's dot, dot, dot. And if it, otherwise, I want to pass it all on to log. And mean and log have completely different arguments. And so the names of those arguments, I don't know what they are. Um, like, oh, you probably wouldn't want to do exactly this, but this kind of <laughs> idea can come up where you're like, and whatever else they pass in, just pass it along onto the other function. Um, and so that that kind of thing, like that, that's getting close to a use case that you might have, where you just you don't know what else they might pass in, it, or what else they might pass in depends on what is happening next. And, and dot 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 lets you do this. Um, yeah, just pass. Yeah, wow. whatever else happens. So that's um, like super flexible. Yeah, and like it can okay. be, it can be weird. Like yeah, um, but. It's, uh, it's, it's a really useful feature of R, I think. Um, and I don't know, Ryan has also written in other programming languages. I can't think of an equivalent in anything I've written, but it's been a while since I've written anything other than R. Okay. Um, it's kind of weird to like allow you to just say, eh, whatever, <laughs> like, whatever they do, just pass it along. So well, I think, uh, John, to add to that statement, uh, there was a discussion that June provided in our ggplot book club, and it was kind of an ad hoc. It wasn't really dedicated to a single chapter, but June dropped inside or, or under, I guess, uh, all of the R functions for ggplot. And he started doing this crazy uh, uh, association, these these lines of, of scripts that I'm not familiar with, and I'm still trying to figure out how he even got to that level. Under the hood of R, it uses a lot of the dot, dot, dot notation to act as a placeholder to kind of pass things over. Um, 
I, I, I believe to your statement, I have not witnessed dot, dot, dot being used in any other language. Um, familiar with, with other Python, JavaScript, or uh, Ruby, uh, C, C++, dot, dot, dot is very unique to R. Um, I don't know if that, is it due to the statistical modeling concepts of what R does under the hood that this particular placeholder is used? I don't know. So Ryan, did you say that like under the hood of R, there's dot, well, dot, dot? No, so like we always remember that, that most programming languages are all built on pre-existing platforms. So when I say mm -hmm. the word under the hood, what I'm getting at is like, okay, we're gonna take it from the R language, you know, this R Studio IDE type language, take that function and then drop down to the C level or drop down to Fortran or drop down to some other wow. lower level CPU, you know, a machine code operation. And then that's where you get a lot of speed and efficiency from, from your uh, uh, programming language. Uh, always remember that humans are, are kind of uh, not great with, with uh, uh, arithmetic and, and CPUs are extremely efficient at that. So dropping down and understanding that lower language can often add to your benefit. Um, and that's the only time that I've witnessed the dot, 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 um, is is inside those those lower levels john oh go ahead sorry well and so i i shared another example that again yeah. it's not um it's not why you would use dots but it's a it um demonstrates kind of one of the things you can do um and that's the actual return of that function so you can put whatever the dots are into a list say okay let, let's like turn this into a thing and if you think about it you know um, when I call that function, it's it is executing list a equals one. So it's doing that, and so now I've got a normal list. It is pretty common to take whatever the dots are, put them into a list, and then the idea is then you can deal with oh, if they sent this argument, do this thing. If they sent this other argument, do this other thing. Um, it's it, it is definitely one of those things that when you have a use for it, you'll go, oh, okay, this makes sense now. Um, and it only will kind of make sense until then. <laughs> um, but that, that, like mutate, mutate is a really key example to think of that it has, it has to have dot, dot, dot as one of its arguments because it doesn't know what you're going to send in. You're going to send in all kinds of crazy column names who, who knows what they're going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so dot, dot, dot is the argument. Um, wow. Okay. That also sounds very powerful as well as flexible. <laughs> and I think, yeah, like you were saying, um, once I start using it, it'll just kind of make sense. <laughs> um, all right. And then the last part of uh, function arguments is lazy evaluation. Um, arguments in R are not computed until they're needed. Um, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and so, oh, great. We're at the end. Um, good, because I need to really um, dive into this part of the chapter <laughs> to try to understand it uh, before I talk about it. Um, unless we want to try to go through it um, in two minutes. Um, but yeah, I didn't quite understand this part of the chapter either. The, this is the, the returns? The writing pipeable functions. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's, yeah, let's go ahead and uh, plan to do returns and environments next week and hopefully it should be super short <laughs> and um, i was gonna say and then we'll probably go into 20 which is vectors vectors okay yeah. um and probably won't get all the way through 20 but we'll see how that goes so does anyone want to volunteer to at least start 20 next week We won't have to do the whole chapter. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Lucy. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Right. Um, I will try to get learning objectives written right away. 
Um, but, you know, don't wait for me. Feel free to start going through it. Um, and yeah, so we'll do the return values and environments on, uh, to start with, and then we'll go into vectors and get through it as far as we get through it. Um, what was I? Yeah. Oh, um, and stop sharing my screen. Okay. <laughs> so, um, cool. Does anyone have any other comments and questions before we wrap up? I just want to say thanks for your patience with the newbie. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Becky, for taking it Great. on. I do want to share a real quick um, example for the lazy evaluation thing. Um, so there's this function sys.sleep that just pauses for however many seconds you give it. And so it's a good one to use to demonstrate things like the lazy evaluation, because if it were evaluated, it would pause whatever I was running for 60 seconds. But because I never actually use uh, B in the function that I, you know, the, the dummy function that I wrote, it never evaluates that sys.sleep. And so it never pauses. Now, obviously just me pasting in there doesn't show you that, but if you run that yourself, you'll see like it instantly returns one through 10 because it didn't ever evaluate B, even though I passed it in there as an argument. It just stays sitting there waiting to be evaluated until it's needed. Um, that can be it, like, there are, I think multiple sections in the book Advanced R about lazy evaluation because it can be really useful, but it's also really weird sometimes because things won't have a value until they're needed. Um, and so you'll think that something has changed, but it hasn't or things like that. So um, anyway, so that's it. That's it there. Uh, All right. Question. So okay. Before we, yes, uh, we had, well, Big had said about the stop and stop if not. And I don't think if I understood what exactly is happening with that. So stop yeah. is um, basically you can put stop in a function to create an error that it'll stop execution of whatever's in the function. You know, usually you would want to put that behind an if statement. So um, if uh, na.rm is a word, you know, is a string, then stop. If it's not, if it's some value other than true or false, you might want to stop. Um, and then stop if not is a kind of shorthand of um, you put things in there that you want to be true, and if they're not true, then it stops. So stop if stop if not is logical in a.rm, and um, it'll just stop. It'll it'll send it send out a default error message from that function. You can put lots of things inside of stuff stop if not, which means stop if not must have dot, 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 right. Yeah, stop if not, the first argument is dot, 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 because you can put lots of different expressions in there. And if any of them turn out false, then it'll just send an error message out by default. Um, those are two like quick, you know, stop, you'll, if, if you write a lot of functions and you want them to be informative, you'll write, you know, you'll put stops in there. Stop if not is a quick way to put a bunch of stops in for like certain situations where you're like, I just don't wanna continue. Um, you know, and they could be anything. It could be if today is Tuesday, this function should never run. So stop if not, uh, you know, today is not Tuesday, something like that. But um, yeah, I hope that helped. Yes, good, thank you. All right. John, can I ask one more question? So what is lazy evaluation or lazy anything? So the lazy means it doesn't do it until it needs to. Oh, okay. And so that's where, you know, in my example, I don't actually use the B parameter. So it never evaluates B. It's like, I don't need that. I'll pretend that it's not there. And so it totally ignores it and, until, you know, if I had some if in there that had, you know, use B when this, in this certain case, then when it finally got to that, it would say, okay, now let me see what B was. Uh, since you said I had to use it. Um, hmm. Okay. Yeah. Can you give me an example as to when that's useful? 
Uh, well, so in my example, let's say I have, you know, let's say it, it, we're a little bit less fake. Um, the B parameter is something that takes a really long time to calculate. Oh, okay. And I only want to use that B parameter if A is some certain value. Okay. Otherwise, don't even bother using it. And so it's like, okay, I'm not going to calculate that until I actually need it. Got um, it. Okay. But that, so the other way it's useful is um, there are some advanced techniques where you use the fact that those haven't been evaluated yet to like manipulate things before they get used. And that's how a lot of the tidyverse, like how they're able to um, like use the, the uh, column names, um, even though like those aren't variables is it, it does some tricks with the fact that it's, there's lazy evaluation. Oh, okay. um, and then there's also uh, 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 what they call lazy data in R mm -hmm. packages. So lazy means the same thing there, where it it can have data sets that it doesn't load unless you reference them. So if you're using a package and it's got some data set in it, even if you library that package, it doesn't actually load the data until you do something that says, okay, but now load the data. Um, oh, okay, okay, okay. So it's that, that same. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So that's is that what what's happening when you see lazy loading sometimes on the console? Uh, probably it? yes. I think okay. that is that same thing. Okay. Um, I think that's the data data one specifically. So, and then um, another lazy usage that you might see. I think there are things in Shiny that will lazy load, meaning it'll only load. Let's say um, there's a table with a million entries. Lazy loading would be, if I'm showing 25 at a time, only lo load the first 25. Mm -hmm. And then if I go to the second page, okay, now load the next 25. Um, and you'll see that on a lot of web pages, like where they have the infinite scrolling, where as you scroll down, it'll pause for a second because it's like, okay, now I've got to figure out what this next set of data is. Loads that data and then goes on. And that's that concept of being lazy. Um, in general, it's it's kind of funny that it's called being it's called lazy because right. lazy tends to be really powerful <laughs> for computer <laughs> applications. Um, but it's you know yeah, be lazy. Don't don't do things you don't need to do. Don't do things until you need to do them. I guess right, 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 right. right. I always okay. replace the I always replace the word lazy with efficiency. Uh, yeah, I always think <laughs> that yes. it's being yes. extremely for efficient just in with, time. Yeah. Yep, yes, exactly, yep. exactly. Same concept. Yep. Can I use that when I'm lying on the couch? Yeah, I'm being efficient. <laughs> I'm being efficient. <laughs> Just having an efficient Sunday afternoon. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, um, with that, let's uh, go ahead and uh, you know close this down, and we will talk next week about the end of uh, functions and the beginning of vectors.